in a little bit, but we've got a good solid group of people joining us, so why don't we get going? Um, welcome everybody, I'm glad to see you all today. Um, we have more than 100 friends joining us today from around the state and around the country, uh, ready to get their feet wet and get out on the Olympic coast. Uh, my name is John Meyer. I'm a board member at Washington's National Park Fund. Um, I was asked to MC this field trip today because I have a strong interest in today's topic. Uh, in fact, I'm even writing a book about ocean life along the West Coast as we speak, um, and that will include uh, Olympic National Park as well. Um, before we get going, I want to tell you a little bit about Washington's National Park Fund. We're an organization that's been growing strong for years. We have a 23-person board of directors who work very hard to help the parks, and we are led by a highly competent and, and talented staff of seven. Our vision is to see that our parks are strong, vibrant, youthful, and everlasting, and our cornerstone is strong engagement with the parks, and we work very closely with each of the park superintendents who provide us with their highest priorities for funding each year. So, uh, on to today and on to our virtual field trip. As many of us are cooped up at home these days, we figured if we can't take you up to Mount Rainier, North Cascades, or Olympic National Parks, we'll bring our beloved national parks to you. So, are you ready? Do you have your day pack ready and packed? Do you got your snacks? You have uh, your water bottles all filled up? Filled up. Your hiking your boots, boots laced up? Laced up. Um, if so, let's board the virtual bus and travel on over to Olympic National Park. Today, our gracious host on the coast is Steve Fradkin. Steve is the coastal ecologist and limnologist at Olympic National Park and has been since the year 2000. As the chief scientist and natural resource manager for the park's marine and lake resources, he conducts research and long-term monitoring in the park's intertidal zone, as well as at the San Juan Island National Historic Park and Lewis and Clark National Historic Parks. He received his doctorate from Dartmouth College after completing a master's and bachelor's at Michigan State University. Prior to coming to Olympic, he researched the life histories of barnacles at the University of Oregon's Institute of Marine Biology in Coos Bay, Oregon. Um, so with that, Steve, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to come and visit you folks today. And uh, I appreciate the, uh, the offer to have everyone lace up their boots. Uh, although I think today, uh, in the spirit of the Pacific Northwest, uh, probably having some extra tufts on because we might get, our, might get our shoes wet a little bit today. So today I would like to talk to you uh, I'd like to sort of take you on a, a virtual field trip of the wonderful Olympic coast. And here in the background, uh, you can see um, uh, an aerial shot of the Point of the Arches area up in the northern part of the park. And it just sort of shows you some of the rugged grandeur that is, uh, is typified by the Olympic coast. Um, so uh, Olympic National Park, just as background, I'm sure all of you know this, but we're close to a million acres, 922 odd thousand acres of National Park, two units, uh, one that rugged mountainous core in the middle, and then that 65 mile coastal strip on uh, the outer coast, uh, which is bracketed, of course, to the north um, by the Macaw Reservation and to the south by the Quinault Indian Reservation. And then there are two smaller reservations sort of embedded in. There's the Quileute Reservation and then the Ho Reservation. And these, of course, tribes have been here for millennia, for over 10,000 years, and are an integral part of, uh, of our coastal ecosystem too. Um, so that's just a bit general background in the park. But I guess my question to you is, uh, I'm going to ask several questions during the course of this. And one question is, have you ever been to Olympic National Park? Uh, there is no right or wrong answer. Well, maybe there is. You should be here. And if you haven't been here, you should come here. So we'll wait uh, uh, a couple of seconds here to see whether folks uh, have uh, been here to Olympic National Park. So um, and in, in the meantime, while we're waiting for folks to weigh in, uh, the background to this slide here, that black and knobbly thing, uh, just sort of wondering whether uh, Oh, wow, 84% of the people have been here and 16% have not. That is great. Um, and so hopefully uh, at the tail end of this, uh, 
uh, this, this talk uh, will have convinced more of you to, uh, to come here. So uh, you'll see this background again and uh, at the tail end of the talk uh, in, the, in your chat box, if you can sort of tell me for extra credit uh, what you think that is. All right, but onward. Um, the Olympic Coast is, uh, is, it certainly is a wonderful place. It's the longest stretch of wilderness coastline in the lower 48 states. It is truly unlike the coastlines of California and Oregon. If for no other reason, it's unlike that because it is largely a roadless coast. So in this map that you see here, all the red lines are, are roads. And on the southern part of the park, you can see that Highway 101 comes right along the road right along the, uh, the coastal strip, but then it dives inland. And for the northern three quarters of the park, there are essentially no roads that go, that go along it. There's one road that goes into La Push and, and uh, the Rialto Beach area that comes right, the spur road that comes right into the coast. But then up to the north around Lake Ozette, that, stop, that road stops at the Ozette Ranger Station, which is a three mile wonderful coastal hike, boardwalk hike to the coast but there are vast stretches of the coastline that do not have a road that goes along it. As a matter of fact, most of that coastline doesn't even have a trail that goes along it. Uh, there are no trails on the outer coast, save for short bits of, uh, of, of trail that go around impassable headlands. And we have many of those impassable headlands. So coastal travel is truly a wilderness and rugged experience. As, about 75% of the, the coastal strip is congressionally designated wilderness, whereas 95% of the park coastwide is congressionally designated wilderness. But as you can see from these slides, that whether you're walking on the gravel beach of Rialto or around, uh, around Taylor Point here in these boulder fields, that, uh, that it is truly coastal hiking. And uh, um, it, it's a uh, very different experience from uh, more southern locations. So the next question that I have for you folks is, have you ever hiked on the Olympic coast? And uh, uh, so we'll wait, uh, we'll wait a couple seconds for, for people to weigh in on this. Uh, you should be practiced with your, uh, your, your, your clicking at this point. Uh, so have you ever hiked on the Olympic coast? Uh, because as, as uh, remote as it is, it is still fairly accessible. All right, 60% of you said that you have and 40% said that you haven't. So for those 40% that haven't, hopefully, uh, once again, this will get you to come on out. And uh, for those 60% of you that have, well, come on back. As I mentioned, this is a wilderness coastline. Here is a wonderful photo taken by a colleague of mine, Florian Graner, uh, which is an aerial photo of um, uh, around the Norwegian Memorial, uh, part of the northern coastline. Uh, up on the, uh, on the horizon, you can see Lake Ozette there. And you can see, truly, this is a rugged coastline. One of the things that is the hallmark of Olympic National Park in the coast in particular is that of diversity. It is a diverse place and the coastal strip is diverse in terms of habitats and then it's also diverse in terms of biology. It's a very biologically biodiverse place. So one of the things I like about this Landsat photo here is that you can see the entirety of the Olympic Peninsula and just from the color patterns of the vegetation, the terrestrial vegetation, you can see the outline of the park. Not only can you see the outline of the park, but also of the coastal strip. And that actually, I think, speaks to a broader point, which is how national parks have really become islands of wilderness in this ever-changing world. On the west end of the peninsula, you can see vast tracts of land that have been modified by, uh, by forestry development. And then over in the Puget Sound area in the North Olympic Peninsula, you can see uh, residential development. But you can see the coastal strip also there. And the coastal strip has this huge diversity of habitats. And I'm gonna sort of walk you through these habitats all the way from offshore islands and rocky platforms to sand beaches. And I just wanna go back to the slide for one second, just to say that there's a general trend on the Olympic coast and habitat wise, that the Southern coast is relatively sandy and the Northern coast is relatively rocky, but there's a lot of diversity in terms of how that, uh, that occurs. Now, when Magellan in 1520 came through the, uh, the Southern tip of, uh, 
uh, of, of South America in the Straits that now bear his name and first saw what we call the Pacific Ocean. He named it the Pacific Ocean, the Mar Pacifica. And well, that was a misnomer for sure, because if there's one thing that we know about the Pacific is that it's not a pacifying body of water. It would probably have been more appropriate to call it the malefic, as in uh, disturbing almost by supernatural means. Uh, and indeed, the Pacific is super and natural. So I think that, uh, that that's probably not going to catch on, but it is not a pacifying body of water. It is a very wave swept, tough, harsh taskmaster of an ocean. And that, that, uh, that physical environment really affects and actually has shaped the entire Olympic coast. And so we, in, in this uh, broad diversity of habitats that we have, we have rocky benches that are wave swept and constantly beaten by the ocean. And, and here is a, uh, an example of some of these rocky benches around Sokol Point, Chilean memorials a little bit to the north. Sokol Point is just north of uh, Hole in the Wall or Rialto Beach. And then we also have rocky platforms down in the southern part of the park that are more sand dominated. This is Beach Trail 4 or, or the Starfish Point area, a very accessible area with wonderful tide pools. And what's remarkable about this rocky area is that you can see that it has sand beach all around it. And if you actually look in the water there, you see a lot of wave borne sand. And once again, not only do we have this ocean that's relentlessly smacking up against the shore. But in the southern portion, we actually have a lot of wave-borne sand that is scouring the rock. And this has profound implications for the organisms that live there. The things that live on the rocky shoreline and the southern uh, sand-dominated portion of the park are, are, have a different community structure than in sort of the more rocky northern areas. And then we also have these vast boulder field areas. This is around Taylor Point. You can see these boulders are just encrusted with organisms. And these boulders do move, but since they're so big, it takes really big seas, really big oceans to actually move them. And so they're relatively stable, but they can be unstable sometimes and get moved around and, and create gaps for organisms. Then we also have cobble beaches, things that are, are sort of sub boulder size. And this is a, a nice cobble beach uh, over by Mosquito Creek, a very remote area of the, uh, the mid to southern part of the coastline. And you'll notice that this looks very different. We actually don't have these, these cobbles that are encrusted by organisms. And it's because the wave action moves them around an awful lot. And so there's a lot of physical disturbance that, uh, that, that, that really inhibits the growth of, of plants and animals on these things. But yet, if you looked at the, uh, the areas in between these, these cobbles, there are still a lot of organisms that, that live there and call it home. And of course, uh, this is a broader picture of our, our, a little bit north of the uh, Norwegian Memorial area. And what I like about this photo is that this shows you not only do you have this sort of linear set of habitats along the coast, rocky cobbles, sand beaches, but also within a stretch of shoreline. You have rocky platform down lower and then you have sand and gravel and cobble sometimes up right along the shoreline. And this photo also shows you the linkages between the near shore and the intertidal. Here you see this, these, uh, these kelp forests that are offshore, that are very near shore. And I'll be talking about that a little bit in a little bit in terms of, of some of those biological linkages that occur uh, across these habitats. And then, of course, we have these gravel beaches, and Rialto typifies that, uh, these vast gravel beaches that are, are relatively uh, depauperate in terms of the number of organisms that they have. But for the organisms that are there, such as surf smelt that use Rialto for spawning, they're very important habitats. And then, of course, we have our low angle, high energy sandy beaches that are, are really uh, exemplified by the southern coastline. And this is the clay lock area. And you can see these low sandy beaches that uh, are just great for walking. Uh, they are chock a block full of organisms that live down in the sand. Uh, razor clams are here and a, a variety of other organisms. And you can see actually this is done during, a, this photo was taken during a razor clam dig and uh, from years back. And, uh, and, and uh, so people are, are frequently able to get out there to enjoy these areas. And of course, another feature, habitat feature of our coast is the often prolific driftwood that is, uh, occurs there. 
our, our coastal rivers are constantly belching out large pieces of wood. And of course, this is an eroding coastline. And as you can see by the bluff up here, that trees come right up along this eroding bluff and then recruit down into the ocean and get worked by the tides. And these, these, uh, these, this large woody debris, these logs provide uh, it's a really important habitat for a variety of organisms that live in the upper beach. Uh, and also, they provide a certain level of armoring and protection of the beach. Also, you can see that uh, this is a sandy beach and this upper portion has a lot of cobble on it too. Okay, and then to sort of round out our, our sort of habitat inventory, once again, we go back to the point of arches because we have in the park approximately 490 offshore islands and, and also sea stacks. And so here you can see a variety of these offshore islands off of uh, Point of the Arches and sea stacks. So another question, just to make sure you're, uh, you're still with me, is uh, when you are hiking on the coast, should you pay attention to the tides? Should you plan for the tides? Are the tides an important aspect to the coast? So we'll just uh, sort of wait here for a second to see what uh, what folks think either yes no or i don't know and once again draw your attention to that background image what do you think that is hmm. curious all right the results are in yes a resounding a resounding yes 98 percent of you said that you should definitely pay attention to the tides and you definitely should for two reasons one if you come during a high tide you might not see as much of the grandeur of the coast if you're just looking at it under high tide. But also there's a really important safety uh, tip here, which is that if you are hiking on the, on the coast, and particularly going around the rocky headlands, that you wanna make sure that you uh, are paying attention to the tides because if you get caught by the tides, that can be a life-threatening thing. So the tides are certainly something to pay attention to when you're out on the coast, both from an aesthetic standpoint and from a safety standpoint. Okay. Destruction Island. This is one of our offshore islands, a magnificent island with an incredible rocky intertidal zone that's approximately three miles off of Claylock. This is an old, uh, there is an old uh, and historic lighthouse on this island. And then also we have a variety, as I mentioned, of 490 odd other offshore islands. Now these offshore islands are actually, the upland portions are managed by the Fish and Wildlife Service as Fish and Wildlife Refuges. However, uh, they are within the National Park and the intertidal zone of these areas are actually managed by the National Park Service. And these intertidal zones are, are really cool spots, but they're also relatively inaccessible. So they, uh, they, they act as sort of uh, de facto marine reserves, if you will. And this is another uh, a shot of a sea stack. This is an iconic part of the Olympic Coast. Here you see hole in the wall just on the northern part of Rialto Beach with its iconic sea stacks. Now in terms of to, to round out our discussion of habitat diversity here, I love this particular aerial photo of the Point of the Arches. And one of the things that I like about this is that this encapsulates the diversity of habitats in Olympic National Park. One of the things is that not only do we have these diverse habitats, but these diverse habitats are really close together. So here you have the tail end of Shai Shai Beach off to the left, and then you have the central cove here in Point of the Arches, which is sort of a rocky platform, cobbly sand and gravel area. And then you have this more rocky area to the, to the, uh, to the, uh, to the south, uh, over to the right. And one of the things that you see, not only that you have all these habitats crunched right together, but also look how the coastal ocean interacts with it. Out here, you see once again that wave-borne sand off of the sandy beach. And even in this mid area, you see a lot of wave-borne sand and sediment that is pummeling these organisms that are in this area. And then over to the right here, to the south, you see, you don't see nearly as much of that wave-borne sand because this area is not sand dominated. So this, this photo, I think, really beautifully encapsulates the diversity of physical environments and, and habitats that, that, that really uh, are key 
for the biological diversity that is represented in Olympic National Park. And of course, as I mentioned, the coast is ever eroding. Those offshore islands and the, the uh, sea stacks, once upon a time, were part of the coastline. And that coastline is eroding because of the relentless beat of the Pacific Ocean and also because this is a rainforest coastline. So if we get an inordinate amount of rain, over 90 to 130 inches of rain on the coast, and this ground gets saturated. And you can see in some of these slides here how that, that saturated ground just leads to, to mass wasting or failure of the ground. And, and once again, recruiting an awful lot of trees and wood into the, uh, into the intertidal environment. And those trees also fail, play an important function in terms of then smacking up against rocky habitat and, and destroying organisms and making patches for new organisms to settle. And of course, uh, some of the things that we, some of the iconic things that we think that, uh, that are persistent always on the coastline are not. This is a, a, a sea stack on the northern part of Rialto Beach. This is how it historically looked. I'll point you out to this little sea stack to the right. And then several years ago, that sea stack finally gave in to the, uh, the calling of the Pacific Ocean and broke and fell. And that happened during the, uh, the late winter and it must have made a heck of a noise when it came down because this thing is the size of a couple city buses. Okay, enough about habitat, a little bit about biological diversity. Uh, the Olympic coast is a biodiversity hotspot. There are more species, or arguably more species, of macroinvertebrates, marine invertebrates, and seaweeds on the Olympic coast, that 60 mile stretch, 65 mile stretch, than any other place on the entire west coast of North America, from Alaska down to Panama. It truly is a remarkable intertidal zone, that zone between the high tides and the low tides. And here in this, in this slide, you can see that this rocky surface is just encrusted with an amazing diversity of marine invertebrates and seaweeds. And a little bit earlier, I showed the background to this slide with the offshore uh, kelp forests. But one of the things that I wanted to sort of drive home is that there really is this uh, linkage between the intertidal zone and the nearshore zone. Because most of those organisms that are encrusting and living on the coast actually have complex life histories, a complex life cycle. So while their adult stage may be encrusted to the rock, they have a larval stage, which actually lives in the water, in the water column and can disperse tens to hundreds of kilometers. And here you see uh, an adult barnacle that produces from eggs, this nauplius, it's juvenile stage, and then it goes through another stage with a metamorphosis, not unlike a butterfly. And then eventually this cyprid finds a place and it glues itself down by its head and undergoes another metamorphosis into the adult barnacle. Fascinating life cycle. Uh, it, it makes our human life cycles look, look paltry by comparison. Okay, biodiversity hotspot. We have over 536 species of invertebrates on our coastlines from sea stars, uh, the, the, from sun stars to, to uh, nudibranchs or sea slugs to uh, sea anemones, a giant Pacific octopus, and of course, razor clams. And then up in this far right slide where you see these barnacles, I wish we had more time because I would like to ask you how many different species of things that you can see just in this literally three inch by three inch patch of the inner tidal. We don't have time for that, but I'll just tell you, there are over 12 species in there. So one of the things I like to do in the intertidal is just go down, sit down, and look at one little patch of rock and try to see how many different types of things, even if you don't know what those things are, how many different types of things are there. Okay, and we have a sea star rich coast. We have the ochre sea star, the original keystone predator. This lower slide here to the lower left shows sea stars just overwhelming muscles. They are voracious predators in slow motion. There is just wailing and lamentation right there going on if you could hear it. It is, it is a dog eat dog world out there. And we have three different color morphs of this, uh, this ochre sea star, Pisaster. And in this next slide here, you can see that there, one, there's, there's this, this common phenomenon that when you look out in the rocky intertidal zone, you can see these different horizontal bands of organisms. That's called intertidal zonation. And that intertidal zonation really is determined 
by two things, biological interactions at the lower end and on the upper end by physiological tolerances, heat, desiccation, being dried out. Because once again, these are animals are, are living in, in this, this zone that is a mixture between the aquatic marine and the terrestrial land world. And in this lower, uh, this, this left-hand slide here, you can see a variety of these, these ochre sea stars that are foraging and the mussel bed, which is their preferred prey item. You'll see that you almost drew a line here at this point. And they don't venture above that line because of these physiological tolerances. Above that line, it's a little too dry. It's a little too hot for sea stars. So they have foraged and cleared off everything muscle-wise below that line. But there they are waiting at that line for their meal. I, fascinating. And of course, this keystone predator concept was, uh, was in, in, it's a foundational uh, concept in ecology and was, uh, was, was brought to the world by the late, great um, Bob Payne from, from the University of Washington. Got to give a shout out to Bob Payne. And of course, we have a variety of other sea stars, from leather stars to bat stars to uh, several different species of blood stars, the sunflower star, this middle lower one, and then sun stars. An amazing diversity of, uh, of, of sea stars. And well, let's not, just, uh, let's not just focus on invertebrates. If you go down into the lower intertidal zone or even the upper intertidal zone, you enter a Dr. Seussian world of of seaweeds, where there is just this amazing diversity of, of morphologies or body types of seaweeds. And all of these provide food and shelter for animals too, including over 65 species of fish in the intertidal zone. Some of these fish are obligately, they're always in the intertidal zone, and some of them just are visitors to the intertidal zone, either when it's the tide is in or sometimes when the tide is out. So we have fish like this, uh, uh, this uh, snailfish up to on the upper left. And you'll notice that it has its pectoral fins. It's the equivalent of its arms are modified to form a suction cup. And if you can see a different uh, vantage point on this, it is, it is a flattened fish. It's made for, it has evolved to be able to, to suck itself down on rocks so that while waves are sweeping over it, it can stay there and be a sit and wait predator. You can see that it's basically all mouth. And then we have a variety of eel-like critters. And even over here uh, in the lower right, you can see that there is a juvenile rockfish. So this, the intertidal zone of Olympic National Park is important habitat for, for commercially important species that are found offshore. offshore. And uh, of course, all of these organisms have a variety of interesting behaviors. Here we see uh, a wonderful shot of tolitrid amphipods or beach hoppers. If you've ever gone out to some of our sandy beaches, you see these things hopping around all over the place. And here are two males involved in fisticuffs or antler cuffs to with each other. And uh, of course, uh, my, my wife uh, provided me with the slide of uh, the great Roosevelt elk doing the same thing. Now, Beach hoppers have been around a lot longer than elk. So I, I think that maybe the elk got this idea from the beach hoppers. I don't know. I'm just throwing it out there. We also have a variety of uh, vertebrates uh, that use the coastline. The coastline is really important for birds, either for, uh, for migrating birds and or also for, for, uh, for people, for, for, for birds that call this place their home all the time. These are one of my favorite birds, the black oyster catcher that are out here foraging on a, a mussel bed down in the uh, Starfish Point area. And of course, uh, you know, it, it, it wouldn't be a talk if you didn't show something nice and furry and charismatic. And we get a variety of intertidal visitors from the terrestrial. Here there is a uh, coyote that has come down to forage in the intertidal. And frequently we will also get deer and sometimes elk in the intertidal because they like eating the seaweed because it is very salty and they need salt. And uh, oh, what the heck, let's show some sea otters also. Sea otters were extirpated on our coastline uh, in the early 1900s, but in the 1970s, they were reintroduced to our coastline and they have been taking off like gangbusters. We have over 3000 sea otters on our coastline, particularly around Destruction Island is a hotbed. And that's where I took this photo of these cute and cuddly creatures, which are important predators on intertidal organisms and help keep that intertidal balance. 
Okay, so uh, a question for you folks. I have a question of what intertidal organisms from this list might you expect to see on the Olympic coast? I'll give you uh, several minutes here. Yeah, there are anemones, barnacles, um, octopus. I don't know. Let, let's let's see what people think. You can you can check those off, and uh, we'll see uh, we'll see what you might expect to see on the Olympic coast. Oh my gosh! I've only got four minutes left. Good thing I'm almost done. And also keep in mind, what is that image on the back of this slide? I don't know, is it the moon? Mars? Aerial photo? I don't know. Okay, it looks like the results are in. People say we should see almost all, actually the correct answer, arguably, is all of the above. Although I'm not so sure about octopus. Yeah, actually you can see octopus, they come here. Definitely Sasquatch. Okay, next. At this point, I would like to sort of shift away from, uh, from this overview of the biology and the, the, uh, the structure, the habitat structure of the Olympic Coast. Hopefully I've impressed upon you that it is a wonderful, beautiful, diverse place. And I'd like to talk about a, a significant threat that actually is impacting or is likely to impact the, uh, is impacting and will continue to impact the biota, this, this biodiverse area on the Olympic coast. And this is ocean acidification. Ocean acidification, by the way, I would have to give a shout out to Washington's National Park Fund because the work that we're doing on ocean acidification, it would not be possible and it would not have been possible without the strong support of the fund that helps to initiate uh, and continue some of that work. So we're really appreciative of that, of that help. So ocean acidification in its essence is the de decrease in the pH of, of, of seawater. And this is a result of largely of anthropogenic or human caused activity where we have burned a lot of fossil fuels and put an inordinate amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. And the, the, the world likes to be in balance. And when there's too much CO2 in the atmosphere, a lot of that CO2 gets squeezed out or pushed out of the atmosphere and goes into balance with the ocean, which is a big sponge. And so a lot of that CO2 dissolves into the ocean and that CO2 reacts with water and forms a, a weak acid, carbonic acid, which then makes the uh, ocean a little bit more acidic. Now ocean acidification is a bit of a misnomer because seawater, the pH scale goes from zero to 14 and seawater is, uh, is, is greater than uh, uh, seven, so seawater is basically, uh, well, it's basic. And uh, ocean acidification really should be called the unbasification of uh, the ocean, but that's a very unwieldy thing off the tongue. So let's go with ocean acidification. This upper slide, one of two data slides I'm gonna show you, basically shows this long-term data set from off of uh, Hawaii. And the red line shows from 1958 to present day, this ever increasing concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. The green sets of, of uh, lines shows the ever increasing concentration of CO2 in seawater. Once again, that balance thing. And then the blue line shows a decrease in pH, that is acidification of the seawater. So this is a smoking gun. This is happening. Now on the Olympic coast, all, almost all of our organisms are at threat at some level to ocean acidification. And so since 2015, we have been conducting ocean acidification, acidification research and monitoring. And here you can see uh, at, at Sokol Point on the mid coast, we have instruments that are put into an instrument package in, the, uh, in a tide pool. And this is that tide pool at low tide on the upper right. And then at high tide, these, in, these tide pools are, this is higher or not the highest tide, because it's not safe to be out there. At high tide, these, these pools are completely covered and are, are, are essentially near shore ocean water. And then we also go out and visit these, uh, these sites and download and maintain these instruments and take water samples that we then analyze back at the Seafoam Lab, the Center for Ocean Acidification Monitoring that I run here at Olympic National Park. Uh, it's, uh, it's a little bit wordy, but it makes a nice acronym. And uh, these are some of the data. Uh, and this one data slide is all I really want to show you on this. And the point that I want you to get out of this, this has to do with uh, calcium carbonate saturation state. And the whole point here is that if the number is above one, 
calcium carbonate is available for organisms to make shells out of. If it's below one, there's not enough in the water, and the water actually steals that from organisms. And at 1.5, that blue line, what you see is that is a line where below that line, actually juvenile bivalves like mussels and clams have a hard time making that initial shell. And the whole point here is that a lot of the time, you can see that our saturation state for calcium carbonate is below one or both of those lines. So we are already beginning to see and feel those impacts, and those impacts will likely uh, translate to, uh, the, to our biological communities. Okay, well, I'm a minute over. John, I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap it up here, and I would be happy to take any questions that anyone might have. I really appreciate your attention, and uh, hopefully I've impressed upon you the grandeur of the Olympic Coast. Thank you very much. Thanks, Steve. Really appreciate that tour of the coast. I have to say, um, for my wife and I, uh, the Olympic Coast is one of the biggest bonuses of living in Washington State. It is just our favorite place. Um, so thanks for taking us on that tour. Um, I have got uh, a couple questions, but I'm going to invite the rest of you, uh, if you've got questions for Steve, to type them into the Q&A box, and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, but Steve, I'm wondering if you want to kick us off by telling us what that image was. That image was the surface of a pisaster of an ochre sea star. And right there on that image, what you see is you can see some of the gills, and you can also see some of the spines on it. And you can also see that white blotch was what's called the madreporite, which is the pore that allows water to enter it so that they can move around. They have this hydraulic system that allows them to move around. So it's Excellent. very beautiful. Well, and I noticed in our chat box, uh, several folks um, got that right. So good, good, good guesses, folks. Or it sounds like a lot of you knew, which is great. You know your coast. Um, I've got one question and then I see a few coming in here that uh, we can turn to. So you, you mentioned the Pacific Ocean is a harsh taskmaster of an ocean. I love that. Um, uh, yet at the same time, we've got more species living along the coast than basically anywhere else, or at least invertebrates, and huge number of seaweeds and those intertidal fish that you're talking about. How can they deal with this totally, totally harsh environment? Well, that's a great question. And the way they can deal with it is they've had a long time to come up with creative solutions. One of the things that I love about ecology is, uh, is life history ecology, is that, that no matter where you go on Earth, not only in, on the Olympic Coast, but no matter where you go on Earth, organisms have adapted and figured out ways of making a living in the most inhospitable places. And while the, Pacific, while the Pacific Ocean and our coastline is inhospitable, particularly to us, uh, and oftentimes the organisms that live there, they've had millions of years to evolve there. And, uh, and, and so that's how they've been able to do it. Life started in the ocean. So they've actually had a much longer time, say relative mm. to lakes or even, even dry land to come up with creative solutions. And I wish there was more time to talk about all the creative solutions that these organisms have come up with because it, it, it really is mind boggling. Wow, yeah. Yeah, and they've had that jump start if life started in the ocean, that's great. Um, a couple questions are coming in, um, particularly around sea star wasting disease. What's uh, yes. the status there, what's going on? Well, sea star wasting disease is, uh, is still on our coastline. And, and once again, I wish I had had a little bit more time to talk about that. Uh, but uh, sea star wasting disease is still occurring on our coastline. Uh, it was a remarkable event, it started in 2013. Uh, it actually was first observed on the Olympic coast. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the observations of it spread with the disease spread elsewhere. It didn't necessarily spread from the Olympic coast, but was first observed uh, here on the Olympic coast. At any rate, um, What's remarkable about sea star wasting disease is the number of species that's affected, over 20 different sea stars, uh, the geographic scope of it from Alaska all the way down to Baja, and the temporal uh, aspect of it, the time-wise, from 2013, and it's still there now. Now, the good thing is, is that by and large, it is, has really dampened down. Only about 
maybe 2%, 2 percent, 2 to 3 percent of our population of, of uh, Pisaster or the ochre sea star show signs of it. We still see it. It's actually at the level now that if it had always been at this level, we might not have noticed it. Yeah. Uh, and but you know, at its at its heyday on our coastline, about sixty percent of the Pisaster population was afflicted by it. We lost about fifty percent of our population. Our coastline did relatively well compared to other places where the sea stars were were extirpated. So yeah. our coastline is doing pretty well for Pisaster. There's one sea star that I showed, the sunflower sea star, Pycnopodia helianthoides which is a soft body sea star that gets the size of a manhole cover. And that we have not seen an adult Pycnopodian, adult sunflower sea star on our coastline. And I've been looking since 2013. Uh -huh. Twice I've seen juveniles, but I've not seen an adult. And they used to be very common. And so there has got to be, in fact, they're a low intertidal, almost subtidal one. And so our monitoring doesn't, won't really pick up those impacts, but there has to be an effect of not having wow. those organisms around. Wow. Um, I think we've got time for one more question. Are you seeing any other climate-related impacts affecting intertidal communities besides ocean acidification? Well, you know, one always has to be careful when talking about climate-related impacts because climate-related imp impacts to a certain extent are most visible when looking back on long periods of time. So with that caveat, one of the things that we have seen, and, and, and the reason being is because there are a variety of, of oceanographic cycles that occur on decadal or multi-decadal time periods, or, or even things like, uh, like, like um, uh, El Nino events and things like that, that happen on shorter time scales that, that can create sort of false signals. But one of the things that we have seen and, and there is data to suggest this, is that the frequency and magnitude of storm events of the waviness has increased on our coastline. And we are seeing increased areas of erosion going on, on our coast. And so uh, that I imagine if that it continues, that we'll probably begin to see some other impacts as, that, that affect uh, some of the biota and certainly the habitats. Okay, great. Well, um, in an effort to get us out of here on time at 12.45, I think we'll wrap it up. Um, so Steve, thanks so much again for uh, walking us down the Olympic coast. That was truly incredible. So really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Um, so as we mentioned before, Washington's National Park Fund has been instrumental in supporting uh, a lot of this work. And Steve was even talking about the, the park fund's impact on his own work with ocean acidification. Uh, last year, Washington's National Park Fund was able to give uh, $650,000 to our three national parks. Um, so it's really been a pleasure to work with the parks and enable some of this work. Um, we invite you to join us on future virtual field trips in two weeks on September 2nd. Uh, we'll be featuring a, a field trip called Bear Necessities uh, which will be about what, what you should do if you meet a bear in the, in the wild and how to avoid them. So for more information uh, and to sign up for, for future, future field trips, go to uh, wnpf.org slash field uh, dash trip uh, and sign up there. Um, and if you're interested in supporting any of our work at the fund, uh, we invite you to check out our website, wnpf.org. And with that, I think we will wish you all a, a great afternoon, and we hope to see you next time. Take care. Take care, folks. Stay safe.